Lives of the Most Eminent Painters, Sculptors, and Architects by Giorgio Vasari Life of Giorgione da Castelfranco, Painter of Venice At the same time when Florence was acquiring such fame by reason of the works of Leonardo, no little adornment was conferred on Venice by the talent and excellence of one of her citizens, who surpassed by a great measure not only the Bellini, whom the Venetians held in such esteem, but also every other master who had painted up to that time in that city. This was Giorgio, who was born at Castelfranco in the territory of Treviso in the year 1478, when the Doge was Giovanni Mozzenigo, brother of Doge Piero. In time, from the nature of his person and from the greatness of his mind, Giorgio came to be called Giorgione, and although he was born from very humble stock, nevertheless he was not otherwise than gentle and of good breeding throughout his whole life. He was brought up in Venice, and took unceasing delight in the joys of love, and the sound of the lute gave him marvellous pleasure, so that in his day he played and sang so divinely that he was often employed for that purpose at various musical assemblies and gatherings of noble persons. He studied drawing and found it greatly to his taste, and in this nature favoured him so highly that he, having become enamoured of her beauties, would never represent anything in his works without copying it from life, and so much was he her slave, imitating her continuously, that he acquired the name not only of having surpassed Giovanni and Gentile Bellini, but also of being the rival of the masters who were working in Tuscany, and who were the creators of the modern manner. Giorgione had seen some things by the hand of Leonardo, with a beautiful gradation of colours, and with extraordinary relief, effected, as has been related, by means of dark shadows. And this manner pleased him so much that he was for ever studying it as long as he lived, and in oil painting he imitated it greatly. Taking pleasure in the delights of good work, he was ever selecting, for putting into his pictures, the greatest beauty and the greatest variety that he could find. And nature gave him a spirit so benign, and with this, both in oil painting and in fresco, he made certain living forms and other things so soft, so well harmonized, and so well blended in the shadows, that many of the excellent masters of his time were forced to confess that he had been born to infuse spirit into figures, and to counterfeit the freshness of living flesh better than any other painter, not only in Venice, but throughout the whole world. In his youth he executed in Venice many pictures of Our Lady, and other portraits from nature, which are very lifelike and beautiful of which we still have proof in three most beautiful heads in oils by his hand, which are in the study of the very reverent Grimani, patriarch of Aquileia. One represents David, and it is reported to be his own portrait, with long locks reaching to the shoulders, as was the custom of those times. It is so vivacious and so fresh in colouring that it seems to be living flesh, and there is armour on the breast, as there is on the arm with which he is holding the severed head of Goliath. The second is a much larger head portrayed from nature. One hand is holding the red cap of a commander, and there is a cape of fur, below which is one of the old-fashioned doublets. This is believed to represent some military leader. The third is that of a boy, as beautiful as could be, with fleecy hair. These works demonstrate the excellence of Giorgione, and no less the affection which that great patriarch has ever borne to his genius, holding them very dear, and that rightly. In Florence, in the house of the sons of Giovanni Borgherini, there is a portrait by his hand of the said Giovanni, taken when he was a young man in Venice, and in the same picture is the master who was teaching him, and there are no two heads to be seen with better touches in the flesh colours or with more beautiful tints in the shadows. In the house of Anton de Nobili there is another head of a captain in armour, very lively and spirited, which is said to be one of the captains whom Consalvo Farente took with him to Venice when he visited Doge Agostino Barberigo. 
at which time, it is related, Giorgione made a portrait of the great Consolvo in armour, which was a very rare work, insomuch that there was no more beautiful painting than this to be seen, and Consolvo took it away with him. Giorgione made many other portraits which are scattered throughout many parts of Italy, all very beautiful, as may be believed from that of Leonardo Loredano, painted by Giorgione when Leonardo was doge, which I saw exhibited on one ascension day, when I seemed to see that most illustrious prince alive. There is also one at Faenza, in the house of Giovanni da Castel Bolognese, an excellent engraver of cameos and crystals, which work, executed for his father-in-law, is truly divine, since there is such a harmony in the gradation of the colours that it appears to be rather in relief than painted. Giorgione took much delight in painting in fresco, and one among many works that he executed was the whole of a façade of the Sassoranzo on the Piazza di San Polo, wherein, besides many pictures and scenes and other things of fancy, there may be seen a picture painted in oils on the plaster, a work which has withstood rain, sun, and wind, and has remained fresh up to our own day. There is also a spring, which appears to me to be one of the most beautiful works that he painted in fresco, and it is a great pity that time has consumed it so cruelly. For my part, I know nothing that injures works in fresco more than the Sirocco, and particularly near the sea, where it always brings a salt moisture with it. There broke out at Venice, in the year 1504, in the Fondaco dei Tedeschi, by the Ponte del Rialto, a most terrible fire, which consumed the whole building and all the merchandise, to the very great loss of the merchants. Wherefore the Signoria of Venice ordained that it should be rebuilt anew, and it was speedily furnished with more accommodation in the way of living rooms, and with greater magnificence, adornment, and beauty. Thereupon, the fame of Giorgione having grown great, it was ordained after deliberation by those who had charge of the matter, that Giorgione should paint it in fresco with colours according to his own fancy, provided only that he gave proof of his genius and executed an excellent work, since it would be in the most beautiful place and most conspicuous sight in the city. And so Giorgione put his hand to the work, but thought of nothing save of making figures according to his own fancy, in order to display his art, so that, in truth, there are no scenes to be found there with any order, or representing the deeds of any distinguished person, either ancient or modern. And I, for my part, have never understood them, nor have I found, for all the inquiries that I have made, any one who understands them. For in one place there is a woman, in another a man, in diverse attitudes, while one has the head of a lion near him, and another an angel in the guise of a cupid. Nor can one tell what it may all mean. There is indeed over the principal door, which opens into the Macaria, a woman seated who has at her feet the severed head of a giant, almost in the form of a Judith. She is raising the head with her sword, and speaking with a German, who is below her. But I have not been able to determine for what he intended her to stand, unless, indeed, he may have meant her to represent Germany. However, it may be seen that his figures are well grouped, and that he was ever making progress, and there are in it heads and parts of figures very well painted, and most vivacious in colouring. In all that he did there, he aimed at being faithful to nature, without any imitation of another's manner. And the work is celebrated and famous in Venice, no less for what he painted therein than through its convenience for commerce and its utility to the commonwealth. He executed a picture of Christ bearing the cross, with a Jew dragging him along, which in time was placed in the church of San Rocco, and which now, through the veneration that many feel for it, works miracles, as all may see. He worked in various places, such as Castel Franco, and throughout the territory of Treviso, and he made many portraits for Italian princes. 
and many of his works were sent out of Italy, as things truly worthy to bear testimony, that if Tuscany had a superabundance of craftsmen in every age, the region beyond, near the mountains, was not always abandoned and forgotten by heaven. It is related that Giorgione, at the time when Andrea Verrocchio was making his bronze horse, fell into an argument with certain sculptors, who maintained, since sculpture showed various attitudes and aspects in one single figure to one walking round it, that for this reason it surpassed painting, which only showed one side of a figure. Giorgione was of the opinion that there could be shown in a painted scene, without any necessity for walking round, at one single glance, all the various aspects that a man can present in many gestures, a thing which sculpture cannot do without a change of position and point of view, so that in her case the points of view are many and not one. Moreover, he proposed to show in one single painted figure the front, the back, and the profile on either side, a challenge which brought them to their senses, and he did it in the following way. He painted a naked man with his back turned, at whose feet was a most limpid pool of water, wherein he painted the reflection of the man's front. At one side was a burnished cuirass that he had taken off, which showed his left profile, since everything could be seen on the polished surface of the piece of armour, and on the other side was a mirror, which reflected the other profile of the naked figure which was a thing of most beautiful and bizarre fancy, whereby he sought to prove that painting does in fact, with more excellence, labour and effect, achieve more at one single view of a living figure than does sculpture. And this work was greatly extolled and admired, as something ingenious and beautiful. He also made a portrait from life of Caterina, Queen of Cyprus, which I once saw in the hands of the illustrious Messer Giovanni Cornaro. There is in our book a head coloured in oils, the portrait of a German of the Fugger family, who was at that time one of the chief merchants in the Fondaco de Tedeschi, which is an admirable work, together with other sketches and drawings made by him with the pen. While Giorgione was employed in doing honour both to himself and to his country, and frequenting many houses in order to entertain his various friends with his music, he became enamoured of a lady, and they took much joy, one with another, in their love. Now it happened that in the year 1511 she became infected with the plague, without, however, knowing anything about it and Giorgione, visiting her as usual, caught the plague in such a manner that in a short time at the age of thirty-four he passed away to the other life, not without infinite grief on the part of his many friends, who loved him for his virtues, and great hurt to the world, which thus lost him. However, they could bear up against this hurt and loss, in that he left behind him two excellent disciples, in Sebastiano the Venetian, who afterwards became friar of the Piombo at Rome, and Tiziano da Cadore, who not only equalled him, but surpassed him greatly, of both of whom we will speak at the proper time, describing fully the honour and benefit that they have conferred on art. <laughs> 